I want to welcome you to the 39th Trail of Courage Living History Festival. Um, we started it at uh, on the Trail of Death, which is uh, uh, State Road 25 at Clyde Ness Farm, and the next year we moved it to uh, um, Kearns Woods, and then we came out to this woods in 1985. So this festival has grown, and this was just a wooded area. There were no buildings on this. We bought uh, 30 acres for 35, no, 35 acres for $30,000, and uh, built a museum, and cleared this all out, and made uh, the stages, and made the food booths and everything. So it is really, really growing in the 39 years that we've had this. Uh, we're going to raise the flag now, and uh, the Fife and Drum Corps will play. This is uh, a 19 or an 1837 flag, I think. But anyway, it's never been decommissioned, so we need to pay our respect to it. Put your hands over your heart like you would for today's flag, and the veterans can give a salute if they wish. Thank you very much, John Bursaw and George Godfrey, who raised the flag, and the River Valley Colonials Fife and Drum Corps from Wisconsin for playing for us. Uh, you know, our national anthem was written in, um, what was it, 1812 or 1814. But before that, they had another song they used for the national anthem called Chester. Was that what you were playing? Okay, so they were playing Chester. Uh, some of the songs uh, that, um, were used as our national anthem and things like that. Actually, it came from old British drinking songs. <laughs> the rhythm, you know, <laughs> not the words. <laughs> and then uh, for many years, uh, America was our national anthem until 1931, because people tell me who went to the one-room schools that they sang America every morning. And 1931 is when the Star Spangled Banner was adapted as our uh, national anthem. Well, I want to tell you a little bit about the uh, Trail of Death. There are people who have not heard of it. There are people who have not heard the word Potawatomi. It's not as well known, for instance, as Sioux or Cherokee or some of the other tribes, but the Potawatomi signed more treaties than any other tribe. And the Trail of Death was when they were forcibly removed from Indiana in 1838. Um, not to be mixed up with the Trail of Tears, which was the Cherokee removal, they were being removed the same time in the fall of 1838 from the Smoky Mountains to Oklahoma. And the Potawatomi were forcibly removed from Indiana to Kansas in the fall of 1838. Then our Trail of Courage is a different thing entirely. That's just the name of our festival. So I'll try not to get your tongue tangled and say that this is the Trail of Death. This is the Trail of Courage here, which is our festival. And uh, uh, we got that name from uh, when in 1976, Governor Bowen came and dedicated the uh, uh, Trail of Death marker that the Boy Scouts had erected for the first death on the uh, Trail of Death. And our son, Alan, is he here? He's up eating. Okay, well, I was going to introduce him, but he was a Boy Scout in 1976, and um, they put up this marker at Mud Creek for the first death on the Trail of Death. And when Governor Bowen came to dedicate it, he called it a Trail of Courage. So we thought, Oh, that's a better name for our festival than calling it Trail of Death Festival. Because we wanted to show when this was still Potawatomi territory, before the Trail of Death. So that's why we have as the target date of this event, 1832. See, William Polk came here in 1830 as the first white settler, and he um, was the surveyor of the Michigan Road, 
and he built a house then in 1832 and we have that white house up there at the museum and if you have a chance go through it um, we don't have anything uh, from 1832 except the house the furniture was all donated by people more recently but it shows mostly uh, 1920 to 1925 that village that we have up there um, as they started out on the Trail of Death, they rounded them up at Menominee's Village, which is close to Menominee's Statue. And that's north of us up by uh, Clement, Twin Lakes. And then you'd think going west, they would head west, but nope, they headed east because they came to the Michigan Road. And came down the Michigan Road, which was a well-traveled road. Well, actually, more, um, it had the stumps cut off so your wagons could go over the top. It wasn't really that much of a road. Did you ever hear the expression, got stumped? is because your wagon got caught on a stump on the road and so you were stumped. But anyway, uh, they came down the Michigan Road and they camped the first night at the Tippecanoe River and that was William Polk's village called Chippeway. Well, we call this Chippeway Village, which is our, our recreation of Chippeway Village. And we say, oh, this was the crossroads of America because it was here in Indiana, which is the crossroads of America. And so Chippeway Village, uh, today we have a lot of traders here. So we have a lot of interesting things out there that you can trade for and, and buy and uh, foods. Then uh, they were at uh, Dippigini River and uh, Old 31, which is the Michigan Road. And then they went through Rochester at gunpoint, September 5th, 1838, and camped the next night at Mud Creek. And that's on 25, south of Rochester. And that's where the Boy Scouts erected their marker in 1976. So when we've gone on the caravan every five years to retrace the Trail of Death, we start at the nominee statue and we go through Rochester and, and then Logansport. They camped at Logansport for three days, had to get more horses and wagons. There were 300 people sick, so they set up a tent hospital about where the hospital is at Logansport now. And Father Pettit came and they had their last mass in Indiana. And he had to get special permission then from his bishop to be able to go with him. So um, he waited and, and the bishop said he could go. So he went back to South Bend and got his stuff and, and headed out, got a stagecoach as far as he could, galloped on horseback the last part of the way to meet them at Danville. And uh, his book, well, it, he wrote letters describing the trail of death and how babies and elderly were dying each day. And it, it turned out to be typhoid. For years, people thought it was cholera, but it seemed to be typhoid because they got spots and fever and there were 42 who died on the trail of death. Well, this has been kind of um, kind of swept under the rug of history, kind of ignored in Indiana. And so when I was teaching eighth grade history at Kiwana in 1960, um, there was just one little paragraph. And it said, the last the Potawatomi went west in 1838. Kind of like they dropped off the edge of the earth. I don't know whether anybody tried to contact them. I hadn't even thought about it when I was a teacher because I was just in my 20s. But when we started in 1976 with the nation's bicentennial, everybody got more interested in history. It was really a shot in the arm for uh, historians and the historical societies to get moving. So that's when uh, we began reaching out to the Potawatomi. And uh, then in 1988, uh, we uh, formed a partnership with George Godfrey. Red shirt there, hold up your arm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, George and I have been partners ever since in getting the Trail of Death recognized, commemorated, historical markers placed, historical highway signs placed. So uh, now there are uh, about 80. We've placed about 78, but if we count the Menominee statue, see, and, and a couple others that were already there, there's over 80 historical markers. Most of them are great big boulders, and I mean big boulders. It took five horses to pull that boulder over there at the Tippecanoe River and with a metal plaque. So many of the historical markers were erected by Boy Scouts. Over 30 of them were erected by Boy Scouts. And I would call out there and, and ask the school, you know, who's your scout leader? And, and who, then I'd call the scout leader and ask, uh, have you got a boy who's interested in uh, uh, Indians and might want to do a historical marker for his Eagle Project? And this is how a lot of it got done. It's all been done with volunteers, donated money, no expense to the taxpayer. Now the Trail of Tears Association asked me to come and give a talk a few years back and they said, how come you got all these historical markers and we only got one? And I said, because we didn't wait for the government to do it. 
we did it ourselves and we did it with people who care people who wanted to um, preserve history and people who cared about the Indians so that's how this has come about I want to acknowledge those who have died this past year because we always do uh, Bob Priest Burns and Glenn Patton Rosalie and Larry Pritchard uh, Larry is a descendant of William Polk and he used to host the Polk House Marjorie Pearl Gary uh, Marjorie Gibbons Jason Scott Henthorn, George Wesselhoff, he's a pot of autumn, and so is uh, Marjorie Pearl Garrett, Clem Good, any others? This is an unusually long list because we had a hard winter last year. I don't know whether we're going to have this next year. Okay, I want now to introduce the John Bursaw family, and Kathy Easterdoy from the county council is going to give him a key to the uh, county. Kathy Easterday, are you here? Something happened. I guess she's not here. <laughs> okay, John, come on. I've got the key, so I'll give it to you myself. <laughs> you hold it up so people can see it. It's a beautiful key. If you've been reading the Sentinel lately, or any of the other papers, because we've had a lot of wonderful publicity, uh, you know that he's a descendant of Daniel Barossa, who was the first name on the Trail of Death Muster Roll, and then his eldest son, Joseph Napoleon Barossa. So he's going to tell us a lot more about it at the 10.30. I am pleased and honored to accept this recognition. In addition, I want to thank the city of Rochester for its support of the Fulton County Historical Society and the Trail of Courage Festival. It's through efforts of the Historical Society and the activities here at the festival that we as Potawatomis can stay connected to our past. Again, thank you for this honor. Thank you. I'd ask the uh, Potawatomi now to come up to the stage, those who have ancestors on the Trail of Death. And uh, my husband put little handles there so you can pull yourself up on the stage. Because see, I'm not walking very good anymore either. <laughs> I said, Bill, we need handles there so we can get up on the stage. <laughs> if you've been with us before, you know we're all getting a little bit older, and you are too, probably. <laughs> yeah, I, know. Yeah, I had to get up the zoo. <laughs> I want to also recognize uh, Freddie Oden, our president. Would you hold your arms up? I was, uh, I was president for 30 years and retired in 2001 when I reached 65. So I'm going to be 78 next week. So I'm so thankful for people like Freddie and Melinda to take over for me. Those two have worked with us since, since they were 14 years old. So Freddie's been helping us since he was 14. <laughs> and Marsha Glassburn there, she's Potawatomi and Cherokee, our storyteller. Okay, we're going to have a special presentation now from the governor, and I want to forward this with a little bit. Um, I love Indiana, and I do not want to live anywhere else, even in the wintertime. You know, I grew up on a farm in the wintertime, good, you didn't have to get out and hoe and do all that hard work, so I like winter and I like school, and I loved history. I always say I got interested in history sitting on a bale of straw listening to the old farmers talk. Well, I'm proud that Indiana is going to celebrate its bicentennial in 2016, but we can't just tell good things. We need to acknowledge that bad things happen too. One of the really bad things is that the Indiana government drove out the Native American Indians. Indiana, land of the Indians, and yet they drove them out. We need to say something about that. We need to say what's in our hearts today. We wish the forced removals had never happened. We wish the settlers and Indians could have lived in peace and helped each other. I believe Indiana would be a better place today, that our state would be more interested in things that really matter, like family love and health, and less interested in riches. 
if the Indians had not been forced to leave. So I'm glad to report that Governor Mike Pence issued a proclamation honoring the Potawatomi. So we have this proclamation and we have uh, State Representative Tim Harmon here to present the proclamation to the Potawatomi. He's going to read it too. So, Mr. Harmon. He wanted me to hold it up so that you read from his copy, which is a little easier to read. Thank you for coming. I'm going to read the governor's proclamation. It reads, To all to whom these presents may come, greetings. Whereas, in 1838, Governor David Wallace appointed General John Tipton to round up the Potawatomi, whose principal village was that of Chief Menominee at Twin Lakes in Marshall County, and deport them to Western Territory. General Tipton called 100 volunteers to capture the village and then sent squads of militia in all directions to bring in only Potawatomi from a radius of 50 miles of Plymouth, including parts of Cass, Elkhart, Fulton, Kosciuszko, Laporte, Miami, Pulaski, Stark, St. Joseph, and possibly more counties, eventually bringing in 859 Potawatomi Indians and whereas the Potawatomi men were held captive in the log chapel at Twin Lakes until the morning of September 4, 1838. When the removal march began and the Potawatomi were marched at gunpoint down Rochester's main street on September 5, 1838, said removal suffered 42 deaths, hence the name Trail of Death. And whereas, in 1976, for the nation's bicentennial, Rochester Boy Scout Troop number 285 erected a historical marker at Mud Creek to commemorate the first death, and Governor Otis R. Bowen gave the dedication speech for said marker at Mud Creek, calling it a trail of courage. And, whereas, the Potawatomi have remained committed to the protection of this great land by continuing to honorably serve the United States Armed Forces, with Native American Indians having served at a higher percentage than any other ethnic group. And, whereas, the legislatures of Indiana Illinois, Missouri, and Kansas have passed resolutions from 1994 to 1996 declaring the Trail of Death a regional historic trail, and since then, historical markers and highway signs have been erected at each campsite, marking the roads taken and whereas. The state of Indiana recognizes a special and historic significance of the trail and the enriching culture of the Potawatomi. Now, therefore I, Michael R. Pence, Governor of the State of Indiana, do hereby proclaim September 20, 2014, as Potawatomi Trail of Death Remembrance Day in the State of Indiana and invite all citizens to duly note this occasion. present the official proclamation with the state seal and the signature of the governor to John. Thank you. On, the, on, behalf, on behalf of the 31,000 members of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, I am proud to express our sincere appreciation for the, government's, for the governor's statement and his recognition of this day as the Potawatomi Trail of Death Remembrance Day. This is significantly important to those Potawatomi who stand here with me today, as we are descendants of those who made that long and treacherous journey from Twin Lakes to Kansas. Although our numbers are found in all 50 states and several foreign countries, we all acknowledge that our common roots are found in Indiana. Again, on behalf of, the, of a tribal nation of proud members, I say miigwech, or thank you. <laughs> Mr. Harmon, would you come forward because Marsha, would you hold your arm up there, Marsha? She made a special honor feather for you. 
And we have a letter here and an honor feather to give to Governor Pence also thanking him and also requesting that he please consider issuing an apology to the American Indians for Indiana removing them because it was ordered by the governor of Indiana in 1838. So um, we offer that petition to him as well as a thank you and we really, really appreciate what you've done. Uh, Sister Virginia Pearl is going to give a response here. Thank you, Shirley. Creator of God, Spirit of Love, we're gathered here this morning in thanksgiving and praise for those who walk before us. For those who walked before the trail of death, we are grateful what our governor has done. And we're grateful for those who many, 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 many miles before us began in this area and walked for many, many weeks to Kansas. We are grateful that they had the heart and the courage to keep going. We who are descendants of those beautiful men, women, and children have grateful hearts because they have the courage to live. And we honor those who died. One of them died just a little ways down the road, the first one, that first day. We cannot even imagine how tired the children got. How the hearts of the moms and the dads must have been during that first trail of death. But we come back here year after year and we thank Shirley and Bill and all who put this festival together over the last 39 years for all that they have done to thank God, to thank all of our ancestors for the courage that they have. May we, as we move through the forest today have prayers of thanks for all who have come today, for all who will come in the future, and for all of those who in any way have helped this festival to become what it is. We're especially grateful for our governor who has proclaimed the trail of death that began in this area. Amen. Sister Virginia Pearl is from Kansas. We're going to have each person come up and introduce themselves and say just a couple of sentences about their ancestors so you know their connection to the trail of death. Uh, first of all, my partner, George Godfrey. He wrote a letter to Hanley Khan back in 1987 and said he was interested in the trail of death and I got his address and, and we've been working together ever since. Surely have made me do a lot of sweating. Um, <laughs> yep, yep. I will be at the uh, amphitheater, the outside uh, amphitheater over here at one o'clock and um, I will give a monologue about the uh, trail of death at that point until uh, 
at that point, um, and because of that, I will relinquish my mind. He's also selling books up here at the end of the um, driveway. <laughs> Trail, I guess I should call it. Okay. Uh, the Pearl family. <coughs> I'm, I'm uh, Bob Pearl from Cleveland, Ohio. This is my daughter Janet, and we have been introduced to Sister Virginia Pearl here, my sister. I want to thank Shirley for her kind introduction and for the uh, story of the Trail of Death, and also. My sister-in-law, Eileen Pearl, is in the audience, and uh, it was her, my brother who was quite a lot of me, and uh, we're sure that he, he passed on, and we sure our, all our blessings go to him, too. As a descendant of Washi Kamofwe, our Potawatomi great-grandmother, who was a child on the trail of death. Our Slavin family, and that's the ones that are here today, and we have many more who are a little across the country. So I'm sure they're, after they read the proclamation that has been sent to them that from the government of Indiana, that they will we would all like to express our heartfelt gratitude to Governor Michael Pence and to Representative Tim Harmon. The Governor's Proclamation, which we just heard, honoring remembrance of the Trail of Death, is, an, is a historic moment in Indiana's history, is our opinion. And we know it's a fact. Our family will treasure the expression of concern for the Potawatomi plight during that long trail of death forever in our hearts. Make which, thank you, uh, to Governor Pence and make, make which to Representative Farm. Thank you very much. Susan Campbell is also a descendant of a person who's on the trail of death, or maybe a couple of persons, and she's retired, moved to Hawaii, but she went to all the trouble and expense to fly back here, and I think it's around $900. We picked her up at the airport yesterday, and so you can see this means a lot to her. She also has written a book she's got for sale here about Chief White Eagle. So, Miigwech. I'm very happy to be here, as you can tell. It was a 15-hour flight, and that's a bit long for me, but we love living on Hawaii, and we love being here. Um, my family, my fourth great-grandparents, and some other members of the family were at the village when the village was taken over, and they were part of the march, the Trail of Death, to Kansas, which is where I was born, and why I was born there. I'm a historian, primarily, a Potawatomi genealogist. And I first came out here doing some genealogy work on my family. And that's when I learned about the Trail of Death. And Shirley has been remarkably helpful to me. And I appreciate her. We wrote a book together on the Potawatomi Trail of Death, and it's in the museum. So enjoy your day, and just have grateful hearts that we are still alive. Miigwech. Yeah. They did not drop off the edge of the earth when they got to Kansas. They <laughs> survived, and thank goodness they did. And some of them came back to Indiana to live. So we have now uh, Tracy Locke and her daughter who live at Lafayette, Indiana. And they're citizens of Potawatomi Nation members. 
Hi, I'm Tracy and this is my daughter Erin. Abram Burnett, my fourth great grandfather, was the interpreter on the trailer set. And we would like to thank Shirley for all of the work that she's done in preserving the memory of the Potawatomi and the Trail of Death. And we'd also like to thank the state for the proclamation today. Now, I can't resist the telling a story about her ancestor, Abram Burnett. We got time here, just a little bit. Abram Burnett was a young man about the same age as Father Pettit in his 20s. And when he was on the trail of death, um, he became very close to Father Pettit. I think he had been before that because if I remember right, Father Pettit had performed the wedding ceremony when Abram Burnett got married here in Indiana. Anyway, when Father Pettit got sick with the uh, typhoid, and was coming back to Indiana. He died at St. Louis. And the story is that Abram Burnett helped hold him on the horse because Father Ted was very sick. And then Abram Burnett came on back to Indiana. He had a trading post here in Indiana and found that here in Rochester, well, actually on the Tippecanoe River, and found that it had been broken into and things had been stolen. So he filed suit, and it, it's right here in the Rochester courthouse, uh, about that suit where the things had been stolen from the trading post. Well, out in Kansas, he became uh, a rancher, and he became very big. He was the biggest, strongest man in Kansas. And this is the story that their descendants have told me, that uh, Tom Hamilton in particular loved to tell this story, that uh, Abram Burnett, evidently there was a contest going around to see who could lift the biggest boulder. And so this big, big guy come around, and he said to Burnett, you know, I can lift a bigger boulder than you can. And Burnett said, well, you find the biggest boulder you can lift, and then we'll go lift it and see. So that guy found this great big boulder, and he took Burnett to it, and Burnett said, now you sit on it. And he lifted, Burnett lifted the boulder and the man. So that gave him the title of the biggest, strongest man in Kansas. And uh, then he also had a drinking problem. But this was a, a problem that a lot of the people had after the trail of death. Can you imagine being driven out of your home and having maybe 15 minutes to round up, grab the stuff you want to take with you? And then, you know, you, you feel very, very badly. And, and so the depression for years that bothered them. And for the next, oh, probably 20 years or more, people were uh, not as healthy as they could have been. It's like after the Civil War, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, and after the Vietnam War, there were people who had a lot of nightmares. I'm sure that happened to the Potawatomi, too. I guess we got as far, okay. It's time now for me to uh, uh, tell a little bit more about the Trail of Courage here. We'll be open till 6 p.m. today and we'll lower the flag at 5. Tomorrow we'll close at 4. Uh, there's a change in schedule and that is that uh, um, Sister Virginia will give her talk just today and then tomorrow uh, I think we'll have Susan fill in. Oh, okay, they're going to be staying. All right, I didn't know how it was going to be filled in, but I knew that uh, John has to work. John's a volunteer in a museum, aren't you? And he has to go back to work Monday at that museum there in Kansas, Topeka, Kansas, I guess. So we wouldn't want to keep him from that because museums are very important, at least in my opinion. <laughs> So um, we hope you all have a great day enjoying the programs and the food. There's apple dumplings down here.